What's up guys, my name is Fran, and once again, welcome back. And in this video, we're gonna be checking out the Sonnet eGPU Puck. All right, so in this video, I wanted to accomplish two things. Number one, of course, I wanted to talk about the Sonnet eGPU Puck. I mean, most likely that's the reason why you clicked on this video in the first place. But I also wanted to talk about the overall state of eGPUs as a whole. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. The Sonnet eGPU Puck comes in two different variations. It comes in an RX 560 flavor and also comes in an RX 570 flavor. This one in particular that I have is the RX 570, which is equipped with four gigabytes of VRAM. The form factor of the Sonnet eGPU Puck is probably one of its coolest features. At first glance, it looks more like an external hard drive than an external graphics card, but at a closer glance, there are a number of features that give away the fact that it is an eGPU. There are a number of ventilation grills on the front and on the sides of the Sonnet eGPU puck. Now, if you look through these actual grills, you will see a number of heat spreaders as well as a number of heat pipes. When looking top down at the Sonnet eGPU puck through the grill, you will notice a fan. That fan is there to cool the GPU itself and the VRAM. When looking towards the back of the Sonnet eGPU puck, this is where you're going to find all of your I.O. So just like a regular desktop RX 570, you're going to find three display ports ports, you're going to find one HDMI 2.0 port, and in addition, you are going to find a Thunderbolt 3 port because this is a Thunderbolt 3 eGPU enclosure, if I haven't mentioned that, then also you are going to find a power port. Speaking of power, the way they were able to keep the form factor of the Sony eGPU puck so small was actually with an external power brick. Now, this is featuring an RX 570, so we do know that is a very power-hungry card. So it does come with a very big power brick. I mean, we're talking Xbox One size, but it is a capable of providing up to 220 watts, which is just enough for the RX 570. All right, so as far as the performance on the Sony eGPU Puck, I'm happy to report that it did perform really well. Now, obviously it's more of a unique product, so it's harder to do a direct comparison, but I did take one of my desktop RX 570s. I also had four gigabytes of VRAM and compare the two. Now, when you look at the two numbers, they probably seem like they're within 10% of each other, and that is pretty good considering the bandwidth constraints. And like I just said before, overall, I'm pretty satisfied with performance from the Sony eGPU. And now my state of eGPU speech. <clears throat> the year is 2018. Computers are getting smaller and smaller, their processes are getting more and more powerful, and even the manufacturing process is also getting smaller as well. It seems like humans all over the world are getting more and more obsessed with microcomputing, and I mean that more in the literal sense. We're seeing smaller and thinner, powerful laptops, and we're even seeing more of the desktop gaming community going to smaller and smaller ITX cases while still trying to maintain the performance of a full-size case as well. eGPUs are a product of our obsession with microcomputing. More and more as consumers go out and shop for laptops, they're always looking for the then it's lightest option that packs the most punch. And we're even seeing this on the Macintosh Apple side of things where every design generation is thinner than the last and also offers more power than the last generation as well. One caveat to having a thinner and lighter laptop generally means we have less room for air ventilation. And despite shrinking die manufacturing processes coming out smaller and smaller every generation, our GPUs and even CPUs are emitting a lot of heat. So something like an eGPU allows us to leave the power of a GPU at home while still keeping our laptops thin and light. So now the question is, how beneficial are eGPUs really? Starting off with the Windows side of things, eGPUs are extremely beneficial. Both Nvidia and AMD have drivers that can detect eGPUs as soon as you plug them into a, your computer, and they automatically will switch over, routing all video through that eGPU. There's very little setup involved here. You don't really have to run any scripts. You don't have to make any modifications to your operating system, and honestly, it just works. Now, depending on the actual graphics card or eGPU enclosure that you do use, there are gonna be some performance discrepancies compared to actually having this plugged in directly. I've covered this in my last couple of eGPU videos. However, it still performs really well, and I think if you do have a laptop that's pretty powerful and you just wanna maybe play some more casual games or, or just overall just wanna have something for maybe better AI compute or you want a powerful, uh, power a powerful 4K or 5K display, you are still gonna have that option there that's uh, gonna work for you. But now switching gears over to the Macintosh side of things, here's where things get a little bit useless. When pairing up my Mac with any one of the eGPU enclosures, whether it be the Sony eGPU Puck, or even the Akira Note Pro paired up with the RX Vega 56, or even my NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti, did not yield any performance enhancements. Considering eGPUs are natively supported in macOS High Sierra, there aren't any drivers you need to install or any software you need to install, or even any uh, options in the system preferences you need to modify to make your computer detect the eGPU. 
At the same time, since there aren't any drivers or any options in the system preferences, there isn't any toggle switch to actually force your operating system to only use the eGPU. Now, I find this to be a major issue when testing with my 2016 15-inch MacBook Pro that also happens to have a Radeon 560 Pro inside of it. Now, back in the day, I used to run a script that would force the operating system to switch over to the eGPU, but that same script in High Sierra does not actually seem to work. So in testing out the limited amount of games that were available to me in both Steam and Battle.net, the games would not select the eGPU by default, and there was no way for me to actually force the operating system to make it use those. Instead, it was using the in integrated Intel graphics, or sometimes even the built-in Radeon Pro 560. Also, in testing out other productivity-based applications, such as Adobe Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro, which isn't reliant on GPUs at all, I saw little to no performance enhancements. Overall, I would dub eGPUs paired up with Macintosh computers to be completely useless. I'm not 100% sure what Apple's angle is here. Maybe they're looking towards building a gaming platform or they wanna bring more games to the Macintosh platform, but as of right now, it's a big waste of money and I definitely would wait maybe for more future generations. But that is going to sum it up for my state of the eGPU's speech. Uh, for Macintosh, it makes no sense. For Windows, it makes a whole lot of sense and you definitely should get one if you need more power for your laptop. Uh, but you guys can let me know what your thoughts are on eGPUs down in the comment section below. Also, while you're down there, if you like this video, hit the like button. And if you aren't already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and get subscribed. Once again, guys, my name is Fran. Thanks so much for checking out this video, and I'll see you guys in my next one.